not so much. It's unfortunate. It's really, really unfortunate. You know, that's who a- can't overcome their stuff? You know what I mean? That's literally like that's gonna keep on coming up here because we have siblings like that. We have family members like that. Like some people cannot get over their stuff. Some people need that, right? Some people just need it just because that's how they're gonna have something, right? And hold some on people, to it just to have something. Oh just my god, to have something. Yes, Please. because letting it go is gonna create a sense of emptiness. Because letting it go is going to be like, you have to face yourself. Right. It's going to, you're going to have to have to be like, all right, what to do with myself now? Now that I kind of faced this issue, now I have to look in the mirror and be like, all right, it's time for me to heal. So much harder to look inward. Yeah, there it is. Um, And when... I went through this thing recently that I read this book. I always talk about reading a book on this podcast. Um, oh, don't worry. I got book suggestions. <laughs> I was reading this. I'm reading How to Be Loved. Nice. And he talked about in a, your inner child. And I don't even know if he said to do this, but it was like, take a moment to talk to your inner child. And when I tell you, I sobbed. It literally happened like two weeks ago. I sobbed and I told that girl, you're okay. Yes. That's great. You're okay. Because that is something I felt like the inner child needed to know. Like, you're going to be okay. Like, we forget that we we are children. (laughs) Like, I was reading something else that said, like, we have to um, help ourselves grow up. We're adulting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Who's that book by? Um, is humble the poet. Oh, okay. Humble the yeah. poet. That's a um, part of the therapeutic process that I went through too. Yeah. So because we're parenting ourselves. Yeah. yeah. That hit me really hard because I was like, yeah, that's so true. Like, once your parent's job is technically over, <laughs> it should never be over. Their job should never be over. But you know, being Caribbean, they they get to a point where they think it's it's done. Yeah. Their job is done, but it, it it's not real because you're never too old to get guidance. Mm. I have I have never been a mother of a teenager before. And baby, <laughs> when mama tell you we just had to start family counseling because me and your boy ain't getting along no more. My sweet little baby that I love so much. I'm like, yeah, man. Because he's a teenager. Oh, hmm. You gotta get up out of here. <laughs> like you gotta go. I shipped him off to his father for the uh, three weeks. Like you gotta get up out of here. I'm gonna go to jail. I'm gonna lose my job. I'm losing my career. I'm losing everything I work for. So you gotta go before I lose my child and I lose everything else that I work hard for. Because who are you and what did you do with my child? Okay, I need my child back. Jesus. And I'm like, I can't go to my mother and ask her what it's like to have a teenager. Yeah, because that was the most abusive time of my life. I don't want her advice. Girl, I don't want that. You can have it. So Jeez. how do I access um, support to be able to take on this new journey that we're on together and do it in a way where I'm not going to be hurt and resentful because I feel like resentment is settling in towards him and how he won't be abused and he won't feel rejected. Yeah. Wow. I would say, I don't have a child, but I would say, think about when you was a teenager. That's yeah. only how to connect it. Like, <laughs> how am I think? How are we going to think about when we were teenagers? It was riddled with madness and chaos. It's true. Like, you don't think about all the other things that's going on inside of their minds. Like, all the things that you went through as a teenager, like all the doubt and all the stuff you're growing up to. Like, right. don't forget you used to be a teenager too, y'all. Yeah, but okay, so the social worker in me says, but and then now it's a little bit more harder now because now there's social media on top of being a teenager. Oh, yeah, no, that that don't affect my house, honey. I'm old, <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> and then kids so, are even worse this time around. Don't do social okay? media at my house, ain't no little children in social media at my house. No, thank you. But no kids are like no worse in high school, junior high school. Kids are worse now, they are, but. That's why you have to limit access. I don't have any access to that for my son. He doesn't have access to those things. 
and you know I, i'm in his life all of Amen. it i'm all in I love this for him. but um yeah, yeah absolutely i think that um when i what what the social work in me is thinking about is so in my therapeutic work i've gotten up to age 14. i've gotten myself to the place where all of the things that happened to age 14 i've worked through found place for and have settled mm -hmm. right past age 14 i'm still navigating and working through it's a work in progress right and so your perfect example um when my son comes home and he tells me something happened at school i'm like fuck that beat that bitch ass yeah and then he's like mom but you said i shouldn't i said I didn't say that. I didn't. And so now he's like parenting me back to my parent role because I'm full on like, nah, we not tolerating it. I'm a whole 14 year old all over again. And he's just like, but you told me I can't fight at school and you told me it's not appropriate to put hands on people. And now he's bringing me back to the place of like, here are all the parameters you gave me. And now in your little, little whatever this is, you're telling me I should break all of those rules. Is that what you want? And I'm like, wait, 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 hold up. Because I don't want you to go to jail. You're a young black man in America. I don't want nobody to put handcuffs on you. I don't like, now I'm like, wait, wait, let me breathe. Hold on. But yeah. I still feel how I feel. You know what I mean? So it's just like, so I I know that even though I've been on this journey, I still need support because baby, I will go off in a rant. I'm like, I'm coming up to the school with a bat tomorrow. You're going to bust that thing. Okay. Yeah. And they better know not to play with you because your mama crazy. And they don't even know what's going on. Okay? <laughs> they have no idea what they up against. All right. Meanwhile, oh I'm the whole God. PTA president at school. Like, yeah. what you look like a nut telling your kid to bust somebody's kid upside the head. But <laughs> then you have to like take deep breaths and you have to figure out like, okay, that was just that part of yourself that you remembered that was being bullied. And yeah. you felt hopeless and you felt helpless. And yeah. you need to find a way how to not make him feel that way right wow. and i need help through that because baby mama want to turn up on these little 14 year olds because they be playing with my baby like they don't understand like, they don't terrible. like they, bro. it's they true are. they're terrible it's, it's the it's the environment that they're growing up in they they're yeah. growing up different than we are and i think everybody's parents want to be their kids friends now our parents didn't think about being friends with us it's either the friend thing or they're growing up with survival mode parents yeah oh yes my son yeah. grew up with survival mode mom for his uh, first five years uh, i just started living a couple years ago sis i was a survival mode person L listen let me tell you like instincts kick in you like whoa like like now nah, i still do yeah. like, certain things i got ptsd real bad like you know what i'm saying like listen growing up in jamaica was hard so mm -hmm. one of the things that i i want to also talk about outside of just like our parents and their parents in is the environments we grew up in and the impact of the environments we oh grew my up gosh. Yes. in on us mm -hmm. and the things we had to learn, right? Because here's the thing, your mom and your dad is from downtown Kingston. The way how they perceive life in Brooklyn is not the way how your American friends' parents perceive life in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. The same with me, right? Mm -hmm. So. I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica too, right? I came here at 12. My own instincts and how I respond to being outside is different, right? For instance, dad used to tell me, you only walk on the side of the street going opposite where you're going. If somebody want to get at you, they have to jump over the curb. They have to crash the car in order to get to you. Why is he telling me this? That is anxiety provoking, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, in his mind, that is his protective self telling his daughter how to stay safe, right? And until this day, I cannot stand when we outside and my son is talking to me. Bro, open your eye, look wrong, people, things are going, shut up. Like, oh my God, it's crazy. <laughs> because now I'm the protector and I'm just like, y'all gonna make people kill me? What y'all hear if y'all chat with y'all see? Come here, focus on what y'all shut up. Now I'm the Jamaican mom acting crazy talk about. Stop talking to me. Go on the opposite side of the road. Like when he on the train going to school, stay where the conductor at, okay? Because there's something going on. Pull the train and make it stop. Oh and make sure God. somebody, girl, like, 
So now it's just like, oh my gosh, are you turning into your parents? This is ridiculous. Like you know better than this. Like <laughs> this is this is anxiety provoking. <laughs> this is fear mongering. What are you doing to the child? Yeah. But again, that is your first instinct. Because right. you're teaching him how to just be aware. Because just growing up in this city alone, you have to learn how to just clock the scene yeah. and then keep it pushing. Like, Absolutely. But yeah. add Jamaican parents from downtown Kingston in wartime, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. political warfare, add yeah. them on top of it, it's 20 times worse than any yeah. other person's parents, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just like, carry like a knife in your bag, carry for a far, bend two teeth. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Make a little ice, a little shank. Like, it's just like, who are y'all? Like, who Vinny used to tell me, stop them up and come home. I'd be like, what? I'm going to jail. He was like, me will go up out of school. No worry yourself. I'm looking at him like, and dad used to tell me, put a, a Snapple bottle in a sock and whop them in the head with it. And I was just like, I was on a superintendent suspension doing that shit when dad told me. <laughs> 30 days I was suspended from school. I'm like, but you told me. You now look at me. Stuck on stupid. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm just like, this is not Kingston, Jamaica. What's wrong with y'all? And here I am, Kingston, Jamaica. In it. My environment, their environment, and just like the times that they grew up. Right? See, I also, I, I, I was born 83. So the political warfare was still happening when I was growing up. Right? So mm -hmm. I have a lot of my own things on top of they putting their own things on top of me as well as, you know what I'm saying? So in addition to just their lack thereof, then mm -hmm. there's the environmental influences, right? And it's the generational influences, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I don't know what your fam your mom's side generational um cycle is. My I am the first mother that has raised my own child in my family. Uh. Yeah. So my grandma, my mom was raised by her great grandma. My mom was, my grandma was raised by her great aunt and great grandma. And my grandmother was raised by her grandmother. My great, great grandmother was. Oh, so wow. my son is the first child that is being raised by a mother. Where like my mom's first child that we actually like from birth, to like adult, like she actually raised us. Like, always thought of it. I always thought that was like the first time that she actually raised kids from like birth to like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, that's what I realized. I never really put it until like a couple years ago. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't understand. I feel like how she views it now is like she's trying her best to like make amends to it now. Yeah. And I could see how like bringing, um, Masika and Kazaya over and like uh, helping with Arita to come over. I think that was her way of like yeah, helping out. Trying to make amends, yeah. Yes. And I felt like that's how I view it and I don't know if everybody else views it that way. I They should, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they grew up, they grew up in a time where how can I say this? <laughs> and then you have they to figure out how your parents actually love you in like, in the weirdest. They don't, they don't know that. They don't know that because that they grew up where providing is love. Thank you. So that's like, what I realized that she realizes that. That's that's how she shows. I had to realize that a couple of years that that's how she shows. She actually like is trying to like say that she cares. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Want someone that admonishes us. Right. Yeah. Like someone that's like, I love you. You're amazing. You're great. Like affirmations. We yeah. don't have those parents. We didn't grow up that way. No. No. Mm -mm. And it's not even just growing up that way. Like they don't have it to give. They, they didn't experience it themselves. So right. then they raised children that way too. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our father was capable of it. Mm. But more, more times than not, you had to initiate it and he would reciprocate it. Mm. But mm -hmm. there will be like, sometimes where he would like initiate it i remember when i was uh i want to say 15 i was gonna commit suicide oh my goodness and i wrote him a letter and i had it all planned out and i gave him the letter and i was in his car it was the last time he was gonna see me and i told him to read it and he cried and i was just like what are you doing i've never seen him cry wow no 
other than mm-hmm. when his mom passed and he was like you promised me that you were going to be here like my mom after she died to help to take care of me and to do everything i need how could you try to leave me and i remember mm-hmm. in that moment feeling like what is you what the hell are you talking about <laughs> like and i was just like uh i'm sorry like i that's a lot to put on someone yeah 15 like that like i am stressed out i'm struggling you know what his response was he rented me my own apartment and the evil mother said she was gonna get me deported if he didn't bring me back and get him deported too so i had to go back because he was like okay i see that it's too much for you i see what she's doing is getting to you and i don't i can't afford for you not to be here like and he came back in like two days he was like here's the keys this is your apartment here, here, keys to your apartment. Like, uh, get all your stuff. You're leaving, and I did. I moved out for like three days, and she was just like, "Oh, if you don't come back by the weekend, immigration, I gotta find a tour on and dip on on and go back and me." I was just like, "Because why? Because my father says that what you're doing to me is not okay, and he doesn't want me to go through it anymore." It was then, a mental abuse. Yeah, yeah, mm. and it's hard. It's it's so like difficult because my partner knocked on the bathroom door yesterday and I was like, and I'm like, I had to call him and like, please don't do that. My mm. mom used to knock on the doors like that when she was trying to intimidate me. And yeah, what? even now, as grown as I am in my own house, yeah, just the certain things that just stick with like you. Hard knock. I'm like, you startled me. I felt like, and like talking about it, my heart just started picked up a beat up again. Like my mom used to bang the door like that when she was going to chastise me or, you know, beat me up or, you know, just berate me verbally. And so please wow. just be mindful that that activates me because it's not like I don't know it's not her. It's just I it's my body like I have. Oh, and it's real, right? It's real. And this is a really, really good book. And I gave Jabari this book. And it has a workbook as well. And I want to give all of you guys this book because I think this is a really, really good book to, like, you know, work through. It has a really, really good workbook that helps oh, nice. to, like, go through it because it's hard. And it's going to take time. The Body but I think Keeps the Score. A, the Body Keeps the Score, yes. Mm. I think it's a really, really good book to start. And to think about like when you have those nudges in your system and you don't know why, talking you through or walking you through like why you had that feeling. You ever been somewhere and you like have this really nervous feeling in your stomach or whatever, you know, you, you yeah. the floor and you just don't know. Some people say like it's your like instincts or whatever. Like some mm. of that is just our body holding on to trauma. And yes, I did experience that. I, I felt like. Um, uh, the way I talked to her about this, so I could talk about it. I don't know. I'll cut it out probably. But the way my best friend was talking to her son, it really, like something about it was bothering me. I yeah. don't know what it was. It was just like, cause like growing up with the parent that always yelled at the smallest things. It just really, I didn't realize those things triggered me until I saw it and heard mm-hmm. it myself. So she was like, oh, I was acting very dismissive on the trip. And I was just like, it wasn't, I know I act dismissive, but it's more so like me holding things in before I react emotionally. Taking things in because I want to mind my business. I don't want to chime in. So that's me being dismissive because I'm not trying to be up in your business. You're being a parent. So I'm trying to not like jump in, but like, you shouldn't be talking to him like that, blah, blah, blah. Because it's not my business at the end of the day. You're parenting him. So that's what I was doing. And it, I realized that's something that it bothered me a lot. Can I offer you something, another way of looking at it as well? That was your way of taking care of yourself. Yeah. Because in that moment, your child self was triggered and activated. And mm-hmm. you needed to take care of yourself. Yeah. And so you needed to retreat into yourself to just kind of soothe you. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, and I so mean, I realized that is something that I, I um, that still kind of bothered me. And I hope you don't take part out because I think that that is good, right? And I am a yelling parent about every little thing too. And you mm. know what's the crazy thing? It activates me. I cry when I'm mm. done. I cry because I'm like, 
I hate it. I hate that I still have the instinct to do it, even though I don't want to do it and I don't have the control to not do it. Yeah. But I don't like that I'm doing it. Right. Yeah. And it could be the same for her. We were taught that. That was the way our parents responded to us. And so yes. we learned that as well as a response. I, what I do with my son, and I've always done with him, after we have blow ups, we always have conversations. That is a part of the reason why something I learned how to minimize the trauma for him is you have to tell me how you feel and let's talk about how you feel let's mm. talk about how i feel and let's talk about my intention and let's talk about how it felt for you to get what i was doing to you um it's important i i make my son hold me accountable so to speak which is not his job but if i'm doing something in the moment and he doesn't like it he can say mom please stop i don't like that please don't do that mm. i allow him to do that because that's important of course yeah he had to just stand there in silence and take it and take it <laughs> and take it okay mm -hmm. he doesn't have to take it he has the right to say this is not okay for me please don't do that because we have to remember right we're cultivating little A adults. human being thank yes. you yes we're literally helping someone yes. become an adult like right <laughs> and so i don't want no um little floozy hollering at my son and he thinks it's okay appropriate behavior because you teach your children what's acceptable in life from people yeah right yeah right. and you know all the stuff that we were taught that we allow people to do to us mm -hmm. in yeah. our adult life because we felt unempowered to say something if that's even a word <laughs> um you know i'll be making it up as we go girls just make me make me, <laughs> me. But we just didn't feel like we had the autonomy enough to say that is not okay for me please don't do that yeah instead i have actually dragged bosses and th thrown chairs at people at work because now i feel like if i don't do that you ain't gonna understand that that don't work for me yeah but now i have to learn how not to do that right and i don't want my son to have to grow up feeling like he's been beaten up on and he doesn't have a say in not being beaten up on yeah yeah it's important i feel that absolutely yes yeah i hope i keep it in i'll see how i feel you should you should i mean i think you should because i mean i told her about it so i feel like it yeah should be it's fine. helpful for it's it probably will be helpful for her to know that she isn't the only one and mm -hmm. it's not her intention. I don't think it's her intention. How else can she learn how to do it? Because as we speak, I just was yelling before we got on this, this call, girl. <laughs> like, I was hollering. Like, I just want to be clear about it. So, baby girl, don't feel the type of way like you're the only one. Like, the social worker yeah, who does know. this for a living, don't be yelling. Because she be <laughs> yelling. I be telling him, like, my neighbors is going to call ACS on me. Is I, you can, I don't want her to think, like, that's a, just a her thing yeah or yeah. like a, it's a lot of parents thing yeah, yeah it's a lot of parents and again how we grew up it is so difficult to undo a lot of what was done mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. the thing that people have to understand and i want the audience to take away from with this right is there so much of the healing work is on doing first the healing don't just come baby the unlearning the undoing the unlearning it's, it's so first. much yeah and it's, it's so much. much to unlearn right it's before you can get to the healing right mm -hmm. and it, it seems like it's going along at the same time but truth be told it isn't the mm. unlearning needs to happen first before you can truly heal it right mm -hmm. and a part of the unlearning is the forgiveness uh, and if the forgiveness uh, is not a part of the unlearning the healing ain't gonna just come you have to forgive something even if you're not gonna hear it sorry from the next person baby i'm working on it mm. <laughs> i ain't there yet mm -mm. i'm still expecting a sorry from my mama i ain't get there yet Ooh, the child, thing that helped me the most it. i think um especially with my mom i think that i had to kind of be like you know what she was a survival parent she was trying her best in a sense she learned everything from her mom so it helped me kind of put a lot of it in perspective and and i felt like 
now I have a healthy relationship in my head and with her also, like I'm able to be like, no, no, that's not going to go down. Or I can have more of a like, um, kind of being like, why are you yelling? Now I can say that, but like, calm down. Why are you yelling? I, I'm, I feel like I'm more in control with this now because I'm able to speak up about a lot of stuff now. Um, that helped me a lot. And I was able to be like, how I grew up is how I grew up. It's not for me to do the undoing myself. <laughs> There's no conversation that could like, I think me going to therapy also helped because my therapist one time was like straight. Sometimes the simplest things help you heal. She was like, look, a lot of that's not your fault. And I was like, yo, that took so much off of me. Cause you know, when you're growing up, you thinking that everything that happened to you is because of you. Absolutely. <laughs> so now you're be like, she's like, that had nothing to do with you. That was your parent. Right. Learn how to take that off of you. And Absolutely. simple like that, I learned how to take a lot of that shit off of me. Yeah. And Absolutely. it helped me forgive it more. I don't even need to have a, like a conversation for like, yo, this happened, that happened. I learned how to be like, she was trying her best and I just let the shit go. Yeah. Learn how to just forgive it even if you don't hear a uh, sorry. I'm learning. And actually I think I had a, an epiphany the other day. I don't know what it is now about the forgiveness is for you. I was, I was listening to a book. I'm sure I was listening to a book cause Audible is like my new- Oh my crazy. God, I love I've Audible. I've had it I'm for like years. And I've had all these books in my account that I haven't, just, I just downloaded and have And now there's Spotify where it comes with Audible books now. Oh, I'll be living my life. Really? Oh yeah. So I've been Audibling this last two weeks, like insane. I think I've listened to like four books in a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just been by ongoing things. So, and I don't remember which one of the books I was listening to. And it was just talking about forgiveness, being about yourself. And I was just in the shower thinking about it. And I was just like, you know, it is to make me feel better about the situation, but I don't know how to feel about moving past that. Like I can, I can say, okay, I forgive you for me, but do I, do I, do I just leave myself open to you now? Is that what happens once I forgive you? Like I'm just going back in and I'm leaving me wide open again to nah. just allow you to nah. do whatever you want. Like, how does this, forgiveness for you work because is that does that mean i didn't really forgive you if i don't just come hmm. come on just like stomp that's on a me good question like, yeah, that is actually a really great question tell me that I, and i don't have the answer even as a social worker about that i don't know because i, I don't I, I mean forgiveness is for hmm. you for you to be able to move on past it and to be able to find peace with it make peace with that's, it and that that's ultimately what it is my mother yeah. Let me tell you why it's hard for me to move on. Mm. She ain't stopping. Today I just so forgave you over something and tomorrow you coming with some other BS. Baby girl, like relax, calm down. Like we you let me put it into perspective, sis. I don't mean like something petty, some for instance, I'm gonna give you a perfect example. You feel supposed to have oh. knee surgery next week. Mm -hmm. I I hear from a friend of hers that she's staying at my house after her surgery is done exactly i don't know that she's staying at my house because i never heard from her yeah she didn't call me she didn't tell me the lack of boundaries that mm. i have to just you could just do whatever because i'm your daughter and i'm indebted to you however you could just run up in my life how you want when you want i gotta drop my life for you whenever however Child, that's, mama, so that's what i you know what I'm, that's what i mean you know what i yeah. mean so if i forgive you but you keep on disrupting my life how does that look like what you know she's going back to the hospital because ain't no way for her to go because i don't know you coming to my house you can't just yeah. come here yeah. that's not appropriate and i feel you know the crazy thing about it i feel really bad about that i feel like i should just give in and let her but then she's gonna keep on just doing that and that's not okay and also what i always tell her how are you teaching my son to respect me because he's that's a parent-child relationship. He's watching a parent-child relationship and he's mm -hmm. learning how to navigate a parent-child relationship. Look so I could, there's one or two things, the boundaries, yes. And then two, you have like 
an obligation to still kind of be there for your parents. Right? I'm always there for her. Yeah, it's like those two things. It's like you either like take her in and then you lay down some like, yo, you're going to have to start talking to me. I don't know if you are there with her with that. We are Jamaican. You. We have to take care of our parents regardless because they I know. That's why I'm like, about. yo, you either take her in and then tell her about the boundaries. But or... the boundaries were already discussed. I think this is what she thinks. I'm her medical proxy. So I get all the emails and phone calls. Anyways, I have power of attorney. I get emails and phone calls about everything anyways. Mm -hmm. But that's not you notifying me. When I've asked you before, you said, uh, I don't know. I think I might go to the rehab. I'm not sure. I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay, fine. I'm leaving you alone. You have autonomy. Do what you want. And don't just expect for the doctor's email that your surgery is on to be the conversation about you staying with me because now you're in, you're notified of when the surgery is. So now you know I'm going to need to come to your house. Uh, I don't know that. Does yeah, she right? still, does she talk to your brother? Child. I don't know what they got going on between them, but I think it's fractured really badly at this point. Because she had knee surgery and he didn't show up. And I just kept asking her, because she was here, where your son at? Why your son ain't come look for you? That's your pride and joy, your love, your heart. You know what I'm saying? We know this. You know, I belong to my daddy. Your son belongs to you. So why am I the one responsible for you? Where's your yeah. son at? I can't get no answers. Being a child who was raised in this Caribbean family, you know, Jamaican home, Jamaican life, you think your blessings is predicated on whether or not you take care of your elders, right? Yeah. But there's a part of that for me is my son is watching. Will he then throw me in a nursing home and leave me if I don't take care of my mama? Because he watching. Mm -hmm. That's what you're taught. Yeah. And I don't want to have to worry about any bad karma. Is the boundary that important? Yeah. You see how, you see how the trauma works? You see how it plays on your mind? You need the boundary. It's necessary to move forward and navigate the relationship in a healthy way. You still second guess it because of all of the other things you got instilled in there. That's the other, that's the other part of my the cultural impact on mental health. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't see, I have been looking for a Jamaican therapist for ages. My therapist that's is Trinidadian. That's the closest I'm getting. And you lucky because I don't even know where to find one of them. I want to be a Jamaican clinician who speaks Patois in my therapy sessions. Oh, yeah. So if, if my clients say to me, I'm asking Muma why I'm out long, Muma say, ya come, yo we know. She don't got to explain, he or she don't got to explain nothing to me because I don't know what that mean. Yeah. You can't find that in my work. There aren't any um, NASWs or licensure. There aren't any parameters in our license licensing board for a clinician to be able to do those things. There aren't any real, what can I do? How far can I go in that, right? Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong because you have clinicians who speak in Spanish, clinicians who speak in Arabic, who do it in other things, right? And how they document. But again, when it comes to the diaspora, you don't have a lot of that right those things aren't being discussed it isn't really there and how are we documenting so now i gotta write it out in patois and then write it out in english mm -hmm. or just say this part of the session was conducted in patois like mm. is that how those parameters aren't clear yet in this work and the importance of that for me is more of my people want to go to therapy we're talking more about healing in our communities now want to go but more of us want to find people who they're connected to, who's going to understand them, who they're going to understand. Yeah. Some of the people them don't talk, no English good, yeah. right? So that's one of the things that is what I'm working on with my PhD. That's what I really am going to focus on. And that's oh, what that's I'm really great. trying to work with my licensure board with. Like, let's do more. With all the influx of immigrants that they're bringing into this country, I'm baby with all of the things where them I come from with them where they're coming from, right? We're taking on all these things, right? We need to know that we need skilled clinicians who are understanding what we as a country are taking on. We, I, I really want to focus on, right? But as how culture impacts mental health, for me, there are good and bad. Sometimes more bad than good. 
those kind of things that I want for us to be able to overcome. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of that, we're still trapped in those things. Yeah. We're still we're still psychologically trapped in a lot of the I would say that's nuances. true. Yeah, the, a lot of the nuances and cultural practices that keep us bound and a lot of us are suffering in the midst of all of those practices and things, right? Mm -hmm. Um and it's horrible. It's horrible. And I really want to see a lot of that shift for us. And 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 I think I get that just from my own, like a lot of my own stuff and a lot of my friends. I was with my Trini friend and we were talking about how insecure we are about making decisions without like checking with our parent first and we don't have to. We both had a, an experience together. I was able to move on past it because on a really serious note, and we don't have to necessarily cut it out because I don't mind, right? And it's because this impact a lot of us black women caribbean women a lot of you know women from the diaspora as children all of us were neglected by the adults yeah. that were around us yeah not just some all of us yeah so you're angry at the person that abused you because you were abused mm -hmm. but the part that my therapist got me to understand is in the midst of that abuse, you were being neglected, all of y'all, mm. that allowed the abuse to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. you mad at your grandma who was sitting with her ear at the radio like this, listening to the radio instead of listening to your fries. Mm. You were only 10 feet away. Yeah. She didn't hear your, your cries because she was like this in the radio. As a matter of fact, she should have never been at the radio. She should have been monitoring you playing outside at five years old with a 14 year old yeah yeah it's true and you're not angry at your grandma because your grandma wasn't paying attention to you you're angry at the person that did that to you who also was being neglected while you were being neglected so yeah. you see what healing does because it puts things into perspective in addition to we're talking about a 14 year old who mm -hmm. was having typical 14 year old things happen into their bodies. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't no daddy around. Love my daddy to death, but the truth is he wasn't there. That conversation with this 14 year old. Yeah. To say these people are your siblings, they're off limits. You can't uh... cry out those feelings on these people. Uh -uh. There were no men around. There were no adults around having these conversations. Wow. So in the adults' neglect, you're angry at the person who was also being neglected with you as opposed to saying, you know what? I forgive you because you didn't intend that. You did not have any intention of that. It's, it's so difficult. And I understand. And that's someone that's a, a therapy thing for them for them to kind of kind of break it down absolutely absolutely but you got to go there in order to get to to get to break it down i know i know but that it's willing to go there and it's worrisome for some people to be thinking that they're okay and they don't need it at the rate of how we were neglected mm -hmm. you need to talk to someone to unpack that because yeah. for her, it was both. It was both parents yeah. that weren't, weren't present. And right? It's so unfortunate. Yes, it's true. And for I me, feel like, I don't know, because I'm at a place like I see the effort that one parent is making. And I'm looking from a perspective of like, I understand what she went through. Um, but I also understand how the parent thinks at the same time. Like this is her way of trying to make things better. And you're still young enough to have a relationship with your parents still. Yeah. But you chose that path. Yeah. And thinking it's okay. It's really unfair to judge that person's position if you are you're not trying mm -hmm. to understand their position. Yeah. In order for you to judge 
and make your judgment make sense, first try to get their perspective and their yeah. experience, right? Yeah. Because in your mind, it's probably like, oh, them that foreign, them have a good time, them leave with them, da 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 da. And the reality is, they were here in a really, really, really hard time. It ain't like these immigrants coming in now with food stamps and Medicaid and getting a little budget and all that. It that wasn't the time that they was here. They had to mm -hmm. be going. They had to work in other people's names. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like they had to get bandulo paperwork. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, let's be honest here. Like, yeah. if you wanted to forgive them, there are so many reasons why forgiveness should be on the table because things and times were not so easy. For your father, mm -hmm. yeah, I had to get that too. I had to get that through my thick skull. My mother's experience is not my father's experience. Two different people. Because my yeah. father's lifestyle was very different than my mother's. Yeah. And I think she needs to get that. Your mom and your dad wasn't together. So your daddy had this lifestyle where he could come up, down, round, move around how he pleased. Your mom did not have that luxury. Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. for many, many moons until y'all got grown, she didn't have that luxury. Yeah. And you need to get that. If you don't understand how the system works here, learn the system here yeah. is space for forgiveness there right because yeah. her situation her circumstances was so difficult right it was mm -hmm. so difficult yeah you know what i mean and but i and i also give my sister grace yeah i love my sister dearly Mm -hmm. Right, that was my ace right there. We had our that was your we had our that was your ride or die. That was my that was my ride or die. Mm -hmm. And she's always been this unforgiving as a person. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if she chooses to sever our relationship and she's gonna move on with her life and she feels like that's better for her, I love her. And whenever she's ready to come back, I'm ready to for her to come back. Right. If she never comes back she never comes back that is her choice for her life mm -hmm. thing i learned is you can't tell somebody how hurt to be from what you said or did to them so i said something i did something she's hurt from it she's hurt by it she chooses how she wants to deal with how she feels about that and yeah. i have to live with the fact that i said what i said i did what i did and she feels how she feels and i love her <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's just that, right? And something was going on with her right now, I would drop my life and I would run. Yeah. Because that's my sister and I love her anyways. But I feel like some of where I will give her grace is the stories that we heard is a part of the reason why she's so hell-bent on holding on to the hurt. She heard that she was rejected. She heard that she was not wanted. She heard that she was injured. Those are the things that she was fed her whole life. Yeah. Right. And I was telling your sister that when we was traveling back after the event, mm -hmm. that was what we heard. I heard yeah. it too. That's what I know. Yeah. So we don't have anybody from then to clarify whether it's true. Because again, yeah. what trauma does is it makes you insecure in your own feelings and thoughts about things. You and you make things up. Yeah. You do. You create your own story. Mm -hmm. That's why narrative therapy exists. Narrative therapy is the that's therapy that's that, called. Yes, it's called narrative therapy, where we help to work you through the narrative that you created and put that narrative into perspective. I never knew that it was called that, yeah. but I always been calling it. That's people making things up out of anxiety. Yeah. They're making own stories up in their heads about narrative oh my god narrative therapy helps you to undo some of those things thank you, you there's did. a name to it because i kept saying yeah. people make stuff up okay <laughs> no people make it up but there's a therapy a therapeutic method in how to undo some of that which is narrative yeah. therapy right mm -hmm. and narrative therapy can be used in a in a multiple my, my my accent is coming out my bad sometimes i struggle with english because you know i speak patois <laughs> patois is my first language people i'm sorry english is my second language i am translating patois into english in my head i just want your viewers to know i i speak english but it's my second language i know a lot of people don't think patois is a language but it is a language is, yeah. <laughs> and i speak patois fully at home in my life i don't speak like this when it, i'm in my home i mm -hmm. speak patois 
And so I am having to translate English into my head to say it. So sometimes I'm flipping over words because I'm trying, the parts are trying to come out. Mm -hmm. And the English is like, lo, 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 lo. wait a minute. <laughs> so, yes. Um, there's, a, there's a plethora of ways you can use narrative therapy, right? And it's like if you got bit by a dog, whatever you created about how dogs are or whatever we can use mm -hmm. narrative therapy in that way as a child you created a story about why your parents left why they're not there how do we use that in order to help you get through some of that right um i think at the level we're at tfcbt would be really really good as a therapeutic method which is trauma focused um therapy like um i think that would be a better method but again based on just what what i know from when i was there and yeah. how sh she sees it because again all of us left dexter left akai left and we we all left boom 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 boom. it was like 93 94 95 like everybody left at the same time then grandma passed away in 95. so like everybody that she loved she grew up with that was close to her everyone left at the same time yeah and she was left with strangers for many years mm -hmm. who was ill treating her I don't know. I wasn't there. And, you know, because things could be perspective based at times. Um, so I I give her grace for some of that, not wanting to forgive because there's no one here to help her work through this story of like, y'all said this is what happened. Now, here's my mama. Tell her that's what y'all told me. And you now tell your part. She doesn't have that. So um. now you're asking her to entrust someone else's word who she was always taught not to trust. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. And so that's where I'll give her grace because I know that that's a difficult, it's a daunting task. Yeah. Unlearning the things that she thought she, that was. But how she's going to unlearn it. She's just going to have to make up in her mind that she's got to put it to rest and just let it go and move on with her life because there's no way to unlearn it because there's nobody here from then to help her figure out what was truth, what was a lie. And not that all of it was a lie, all of it was the truth. Somewhere in there weaved in was some truth. Some people exaggerated some things, right? And there's nobody here to put things into perspective. Mm. So it, without the other people to put things into perspective, how then is she going to be able to, like, move past it? You're like, trying to get through to somebody that made their mind up. And yes. that's how it is in this family. Like, they made their mind up about someone that they haven't spoke to in 20 years. And right. they felt like they know this person enough to be like, I'm not going to talk to them anymore. Right. So that is worrisome too. Like you made your mind up. Like I'll never forget. I saw our brother in the train station. He looked me dead in my face and act like he didn't see, he don't know me. That's the last time I saw him. Oh, on that day? Yes. Oh, girl. Saw him in the train station. I was like, oh, hey. He just looked at me and was like, I was like, whoa. And I was like, I literally said nothing in Jamaica. And I think that was the problem for him. Oh, I'm 20 like, years old. Yeah. Right. I'm and 20. Said, so you don't know the bad blood between everybody and what's going on. So you shouldn't get in it. I was 20 years old. I was literally like, I don't know what's going on. That's how I, how I approached it. I didn't know anything. And I think in perspective for the audience, right? Like, because we have this expectation of people a lot and we um I go on and on about expectations to, yeah okay. to show up a certain way mm -hmm. and we expect people to be a certain way or be a certain way for us to us to be when you're ally. not in the room yeah you know what i'm saying an ally to us and if that doesn't get blind done, loyalty in a way yeah right mm -hmm. and i and i had that right i had that that's why i was acting out now okay because i had that and so the expectation for all your other siblings to have that is insane. Because yeah. to be fair, you guys had a stronger bond with Dexter all along. Yeah. You can't ask that of them, right? That's yeah. unfair. And now we're older. We're past that. Like, how are we going to move forward? That has been gone 17 years, almost 17. 18. Right? 17 years. And 17 years later, we have not gotten ourselves together. The death right? really just really broke us apart. It really yeah, did. It did. Mm -hmm. And I know that he's not okay with that because that's that's not what he wants. He wants us to be there for each other. 
Yeah. Because he and his brother and sister, they don't have a good rapport and relationship. And he didn't want that for his children. And I hope that we can do that. I hope that we can, um, the bulk of us can work it out. I think we just need to have conversations. I think we need to learn that who we were isn't who Not we who necessarily we are, now. are now. Yeah. And how do we work? through who we are now girl I, yeah. my sister, I love you because you're my sister but i don't even know if i really love you because i don't know you yeah i just love you because you're my sister we share the same bloodline we share the same dad and the name but i don't know if i would love who you are and would want to be a part of your world and do you like your sister I, now that's like what it comes down to do i like you <laughs> that's really what we have to work at we have to yeah. work at building a relationship with each other building a rapport let go of those old things because again a lot of those old things they ain't got nothing. Um, but oh, and also we should tell the viewers that it's a lot of us on oh, it's 13 of us and it's nine different mothers. Yes. Yeah. 13 of us, yes. Yeah. And nine different mothers. And most of us overlap in age. First of all, I thought for a long time that I was the seventh child for a long time. Girl, you seven eight and I <laughs> No, I thought I was six for the longest time. My bad, six. I thought I was six for the longest time. What number are you? But I am actually seven. Are you seven? Wait, because yeah, um, Jabari is April and I'm September, yes. Yes, which is are. wild. Yes, absolutely. And then Elisa comes in December. She's 86? Or she's or 87. She's 87, yes. One of them. Y'all right there back to back to back. All three. Y'all seven, eight, nine. That is what it does. If you don't heal the trauma, you replicate it. Mm. Uh -huh. And when we talk about the importance of healing and overcoming our traumas, this is what it, we're talking about, right? Yeah. We're putting a stop. When we talk about generational things and we're talking about things that are hereditary, hereditary things are generational things. Families are inherently diabetic and have hypertension because they all eat the same way yeah it's not some old oh, just genetic coding or whatever it's that way hereditarily because we all are practicing the same things right if we don't change the behaviors we can't change the outcomes yeah well yeah, and literally true. is what we want to have the audience ties back in. into why i started to work on myself before i bring children into this i just felt like i just wanted to stop with me you know what i mean yeah yeah absolutely and i'm hell bent on that with mine i don't yeah. care how hard it is i'm gonna figure it out i'm yeah. already telling him I you're doing let me tell you something you're doing a good job and don't ever doubt it girl like you're on the right path i just want to let you know doing the best you can like every parent tries to do yeah. at the end of the day they're trying to do the best they can and I see you making such a huge effort. So I feel like I have to tell you that right now. Thank you. That's what mm -hmm. it is. You have to stay present, right? Mm -hmm. You have to stay active and present. Don't go in denial. Don't try to like, you know what I'm saying? BS yourself. I'm, I don't BS myself. I'm very honest about my limitations. Mm. Because baby, they exist. You better preach. <laughs> let me tell you something. Um, for all y'all parents out there who raise y'all children to think, Having a child was putting clips and bubbles in their hair and dressing them up in nice fly clothes and shoes. Um, shame on y'all. Shame on y'all. That's how me and Kanika grew up. Nice because clothes. Because after you take the clips and the bubbles out and after they get too big for them little cute little outfits and them nice little mm -hmm. pictures and stuff, um, the real world kicks in and you're not the prepared. Behind skin deep, more stuff. Uh, yeah. Baby. And you're That's not how me prepared. And we had the best clothes and we, did we were too. together. All of us. And you know that? That's like, that's something that I realized that, yeah. It was and I just knew it. my baby was going to be a year old in his little cute little hat and polo <laughs> shirts and little outfits forever. Okay? I just knew he was never going to talk back. <laughs> I just know my cute little baby who always had a little susu in his mouth was never going to grow up and talk back. He was going to... But again... We were not prepared for that. There mm -hmm. were no conversations about those things yeah. happening in our house. There were yeah. no conversations about that. All, all, all I'm saying is, well, 
Just wait until you become a mother. Everything what you do me, you're going to get I it mean, back. I mean, yes. Like, what? I don't want to get it back. I want to bypass it. Mm -hmm. Cheat code, please. Teach me how to bypass that part. I don't want to get it back. Because now I'm getting it back and I'm like, no, thank you. I wanted you to teach me how I was going to be present and I was going to be attentive and I was going to be able to meet them where they're at and be okay with what I was getting. Because you know what? If we want to do uh, Eric Erickson, social work, social work, right? Developmentally, he yeah. is performing at his range where he's supposed mm -hmm. to be when he's doing these things. These mm -hmm. are Erickson's theories about development, right? Yeah. So our parents were so challenged by what we were doing and we want to be so challenged by them. But truth be told, baby, if we want to delve into how God intended for us to operate, this is a normal part of development. And what Erickson says is, if you don't accomplish this stage, you get stuck at this stage as an adult. Mm -hmm. And so why do we have grown people who we say they're so juvenile? Yeah, because y'all didn't allow them to get over it. Mm. They didn't have the opportunity to work through these things. And so now 50 years old, they want to be with a 20 year old. But, you know. Those are the those are the things now that we're faced with. We're faced with now we're going to have to really work at the next generation because it's already started. Let me tell you one of the things I wanted to mention to you earlier in, in this conversation. My expectation of my mom is different. When I heard you talking about like you being able to forgive your mom, what came to me at that time was my mom comes from a really, really educated family. Mm. And so not to sh put your mom down or anything, but no, like, I know what you mean. My mom, I have a big, a higher expectation of her because she, uh. she came from a family that was in the know. She's a sister who's a teacher. She's a sister who was like a political secretary who was like went higher up in politics. Like, you know, my mom's older sister is like that. My mom's brother has a PhD. So like my mom comes from her mother was a nurse. Her father was. Uh, a, a engineer like she isn't just anyone who came from yeah. just any random whatever you so know, you her, expect more from her absolutely so mm -hmm. when it comes to the forgiving part the challenge has always been but you know better look we all know better <laughs> some people don't though like you didn't come from just any random whatever like you came from somewhere where you were able to process through through things you saw nurturing at its finest like yeah. you know so why won't you reach for your highest self uh. why won't you access your highest self choose to operate at this level that you're operating from uh. because i think it's a choice that she's making honestly. yeah and i think that's where the the stuck comes from when, when it comes to her and I, right? Mm -hmm. I can forgive some of the things, but I still have an expectation of you to do better because I know you know better, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, again, those are other areas of, like, dialogue and, like, continuation of this and, like, all the mothers and the different places the mothers come from and the different layers and you know impact on our sibling relationships because i am i believe that i believe that those are the things that are the fangs in in the breakdown of our sibling relationship yeah i think i wish i would have learned well i'm learning now because i didn't grow up in a soft home so i feel like i'm now having to unlearn so much of the hardness i got to so just learn how to be a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more softer. I just wish it would have been put upon me when I was younger. But I have to learn how to be strong and not cry so much. And even though I was told not to cry, I still cried. <laughs> like, Baby, I'm crying. Okay. <laughs> we so all cry. it's, it was a lot of that. I just wished, um, I always talk about like, I wish I would have been more, learned how to be more vulnerable and learned how to speak up more at a younger age learning to speak up in my 30s is wild like you know <laughs> now you speak up because i remember you being very reserved and always really like hid your feelings like do you do that now okay yeah i am better it's still a journey but 
I'm a little bit better. Yeah. I feel like I have to learn how to cut some shit out from before it gets worse. Like if I hear something, I have to cut it off. Like, nope, we're not about to do that. We're not about to dismiss that like that. We're not going to say things like that. Like I learned how to speak up quicker in those regards. You know what I mean? But I'm still learning. Like me and Kanika, we still like get into tests, but we learn how to talk them out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we're able to stay close now, I think, too. Yeah. And we all need to like use that method throughout our sibling relationships, our sibling group. We all need to like, we need to do this in our sibling. Like we need to do a retreat for like a week. And we need to like, I, I said that from the beginning. Like I believe that. I believe that I don't want to like overlook the damages of my harshness in the past. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't wanna I don't wanna just get a free pass. I yeah. wanna be able to sit in spaces and I wanna be able to see the vulnerability and I really wanna be able to see the pain and address it and accept it and apologize for it and work through it because um it's real, right? It's yeah. real. Um and I don't want to make excuses for myself for like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. I think that that's that's one of the things we really need to to do in order to like get us back on track as a sibling group. Because sometimes I feel like I'm going through things in my life and I have nobody to talk to. And I'm like, I got fucking yeah, 12 I heard other about people that. connected to me. 12 mm-hmm. other people connected to me. Why do I feel alone? Why do I feel like I have no one to talk to? It's so wild because like, yeah, we grew up in different households. Everybody took their parents' side. Everybody felt like they had to take responsible of like what's going on with them. And that's how all of us grew up. I feel like, well, me, we had to focus on what's going on with us. And I didn't grow up in such a like, oh, we have to um, connect with family more. We have to hang out with family more. I didn't grow up like that. And that's unfortunate that I I always say to this day, like when I start my family, I want us to be family oriented. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I want that to be that. I want that to be a thing. Like, because I didn't grow up like that. Yep. I'm working on that now. I'm working on getting closer to family because I've retreated like way, 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 way off (laughs) because of just the- um, the Because of the hurt. The mm-hmm. bad name and the hurt that I have in this family. I was like, yeah, so I'm going to just go all the way over there and I'm going to hide. I would say you took on so much. Right? And so we didn't even talk about being queer in a Jamaican family. And like, I, yes. and I have to hide that. I can't be queer in front of my family. So what am I going to do? You can't be queer? I can't. My what? father's a Rasta, for God's sake. What are you talking about? I feel like we should be a little bit more cr- no, you Even know what? Jamaicans are very old school. Dad huh? knew. Dad knew. Yeah, I remember I didn't that tell being him, a thing. But he knew. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I heard after he passed that he knew. People threw it in my face that, oh, your father did she am on Ray I'm like, my dad never was ashamed of me. Because if he was ashamed, baby, you wouldn't have known that he knew. That's mm-hmm. one thing. My daddy wouldn't, he wouldn't tell nobody that. But I had to hide that. My mom made it very, very like, uncomfortable for me to be queer like that's probably why she treated you like that because she knew it and i don't think it was hard to know i never wanted to wear girl clothes they always forced me them ugly ass girl clothes like who's wearing it just like a boy too like i feel like that should be that's why your daddy thought you was a a butch exactly (laughs) like i (laughs) talked about this in the last episode with my friend like this expectation that i have to dress like a girl to be into boys is stupid like it's really dumb to me Right. It really is. But, but I, I, feel I feel like, like it was evident. I never, my friends talked about boys. I never talked about boys. Uh, mm-hmm. I never talked about boys. When she would always say to me, like, oh, y'all got school, y'all got look, man. I'm looking at her like, girl, what are you talking about? I was so happy you put me in this Catholic school. I could look at ass and tits all day, girl. <laughs> you didn't know? And when I finally came out to my friends, my friends yeah. was like, oh my God, finally. Like, Aww. We been new. When did you find out? We That's we're glad you found out. I was 19 when I came out to my friends, and they're like, we've been new. And I asked my friend, like, how did you know? One of my friends from high school, and she was just like, Have you ever heard how you described a woman before? She was like, When you give a compliment, you don't just give a compliment, you give a compliment. I'm like, What do you mean? She was like, You don't just say, Oh, your hair <laughs> look pretty. You'd be like, Oh, that shade looks so nice on you. It compliments your skin. It's like the shade of your lipstick. Like, 
I'm like, that's what I say. She be like, yes, that's what you say. I never I'm thought like, of really? that. Really, like I never, I never even recognized that my that's friend. Weird. Had been, I never heard that before. But it, like, it's so crazy that like she felt like I was doing all of that. They said, mm -hmm. yeah, like the way how you always like were able to like describe a girl. It was like such detail that nobody else ever paid attention to. Like, why were you looking so hard? You know what I mean? Like, that's that that was like the weirdest thing ever. And it was just like, oh, okay, I guess. I, that's what that's what my friend told me so I was just like oh yeah so you know that too was like another layer of like my life where I I had a lot of shame around and it's unfortunate I'm sorry you had to go through that honestly because I felt like it shouldn't yeah well the way I grew up it's like yeah people do have this thing about oh you're gay you're gay you're gay blah blah, blah. but I I'm more at a place like if you're happy enough, if you're happy the way you are, instead of being miserable and you know what I mean? Like that's what's what I kind of went into and in more being more comfortable about it. Yeah. If someone is happy the way they are, then be happy for them. That's I one of like my, that's one of my other traumas too. But I knew that I liked girls since I was six, five, six years uh -huh. old. I always did. Aww. My friends now are all guys. I don't have female friends. Like I hung out with the boys because I get to be around the girls mm -hmm. from I was young. So like I always knew that boys. I didn't lose my virginity till I was twenty. Like I did it because my friends told me to. Like just randomly. Like and they were like, "Why would you do that?" I'm like, "Y'all kept talking to me about it. Y'all wanted me to do it." Like. I and I just you know what I mean I just did boys just because my friends wanted me to but I always had girls I never like was ever without a girl always always had a girl so it's just mm. like it's really you know sad I had to always hide my life okay so we're at the part now that you have to ask the the question what do you want people to ask themselves to get to the root to the problem have you come up with a question um, I thought about something, right? I thought about some. I don't know. Let me see. You I thought wrote. about some? I no, some like what what would I say? Um Yeah, for like what would you say of someone going through sibling trauma that can like start them on a journey to heal? I think that could be a better way. Um think about the catalyst. I think about like what you want to really gain, right? Um don't let it be about anyone else. It should never be external. It should always be. Can we external. preach for a second? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it should always be about what you intend to happen for yourself. Yes. Um, and that is what is gonna really like keep you on track, right? Mm -hmm. The journey of healing is a very hard journey. Are you gonna be in the bed crying? You ain't gonna want to get up some days. Some days you're gonna be depressed. Some days you're gonna be happy. You. It's not gonna be all. Busy. It's it's a growing pains. It legit it like when that hit me that growing pains is a real thing. It's just it's yeah. a fight between you wanting to stay the same and you growing up. Like yeah, that's literally the fight in between of like I want to stay being, but then you like you can't stay the same. So right. it's like you're fighting. So that's what I think I would explain it. That happened to me. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's literally like my question. My question is, what is your intention? Like, what what is your expectation? What is your goal? <laughs> right? Because those things are gonna drive how um, how focused you are, mm. how consistent you are to the process and the work, how serious you're gonna take it right and even where you're gonna end up like you think i'm not heard about my sister not wanting to talk to me baby mama got the right to do what she want yeah it's a little, it saddens me. me it really does sadden that's, me but like, that's the i don't even have sadness for it that's the growth in me mama mm. can do what she wants because i cannot tell someone what is best for their lives because mm. even though i may not be in agreement with that's best I don't know that it's not best for her to not be a part of um, our world and not share space with us. Maybe that is what's best for her. So even though it may, I don't feel sad about it. I just feel like that's what you want. That's what you want. It hurts. Yeah. Cause that's my sister. I love her, but no, she has the right to choose 
what she thinks is best for her life. My only drawback is my niece should not have to be a part of that. And sending healing and love and, and their direction and all that good stuff. But definitely, definitely, um, we should be thinking about the outcome. I think the catalyst is also really important. Why am I doing this? What is urging me? What is pushing me to do this? Um, because that is also going to be one of the things that's going to keep you going. Mm -hmm. The outcome and why you're, you're even uh, embarking on this journey is going to keep you there. Wow. I like that we ended on this. Wow. This was such a good conversation. It was. We should do it more often. <laughs> we should do a part Maybe two. We can, we need part two and we add somebody in. Oh, my God. <laughs> we just scratched the surface. Thank you for coming on and dropping some gems, obviously. <laughs> my pleasure. Um, so say your question one more time so I could probably like chop it in. Um, what is your purpose for wanting to embark on a healing journey? What's your catalyst? Um, what's your end goal? And um do you like, feel like also do you feel like um to help you heal like to I feel like for us individually we we're working on ourselves before we can come and have this conversation together. You think that would help first, like the individual journey instead of going head first and trying to like heal a whole family. <laughs> I think it's different for everybody. I think some people, for instance, Dexter, because of his age and development, I think he naturally already is ahead of us. Yeah. So I think he can do well in just delving in. Yeah. I think age and development is one of those things that you um think about. And especially someone who is actually trying to do the healing because not everybody age and development goes. Mm -hmm. So if you're already, you know, actively thinking about how to do things differently, you don't necessarily have to be consciously on a journey, but, you know, actively thinking about how to do things differently. Yeah. And then for some people, they function better in a group. So for the people who function better and need the support of a group, mm. then delving right in with the family could be the way how it works best for some people. Not everybody works well alone or can take on this thing by themselves. Some people need a group and that support and that backing to be able to um, operate and function well and be successful. Yeah, I feel that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. We, I'm excited for what this could do for other people, honestly. Same, same. Yeah. Yeah. Especially what? Culturally, culturally. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 